Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we have another chempilation where we're going to be talking about how chemistry turns sour. I had an accident once. I had to synthesize anthroquinone in a lab, and I poured a few drops of concentrated sulfuric acid on a heating mantle. It seems that this drop messed up the wires and the fuse just popped. Then the mantle started to smoke like crazy. I told my teacher about it, he cussed me out and gave me another heating mantle. I swapped out the broken one with a new one, and guess what? The fuse popped once again, and the mantle started to smoke, and my teacher came at me yelling about destroying lab equipment. The moment he came close to the fume hood, he got electrocuted from it, and we decided to stop the experiment and let the reaction go by itself. Heating was necessary to speed up the reaction. After that, we decided to disassemble the broken mantle, and we found out that all of them were completely trashed, and the first one I broke was broken by electricity, not by me. Wire insulation had just melted out from every wire it had. Not only in those spots where I had spilled the sulfuric acid, same thing goes for the second mantle. It had molten wires everywhere, even though it had no contact with acid at all. It seems that there was some problem with the connection of this fume hood to the grid, and I was lucky that I found out about it in a harmless way. And the only deceased were the two heating mantles. Yes, I'm glad to hear that nothing bad happened to you. One time I had this uh, incident happen, and so this incident involves a distillation of a specific thiocarbonyl compound that I had made. I believe it was methyl thionobenzoate. And later on when I was working with this compound, I always purified it by column chromatography as a consequence of this. So if you're not familiar with boiling points, oftentimes if you get to a higher molecular weight and you have an aromatic ring that allows pi pi stacking, stuff can be really non-volatile. And so the boiling point of the thing I was trying to distill was about 250 degrees Celsius. So I'm doing a distillation from a one liter or a two liter round bottom flask. I believe it was a two liter round bottom flask um, because that's what I had done the reaction in. I just concentrated it down and I figured, hey, I'd be clever and just distill right from the reaction mixture. Well, that didn't end up working super well. So what happened was I was heating the bottom of the flask with a heating mantle and I was distilling over product. And so eventually, you know, clear stuff comes over because there was some residual xylene I had in my mixture. And then I switched out my collection flask and I started getting some yellow product coming over and that was the color of my product, which is what I wanted. And uh, eventually some red smoke started coming over and I thought distilling red smoke was really cool. You know, we didn't have any pink gases in the pink chemistry video, but in this case I had a red gas or at least a red smoke. So I kept distilling, collecting my red fraction and it, it smelled terrible. Like the whole fume hood is reeking of like burnt rubber. And uh, the smoke got worse and worse and blacker and blacker and, you know, common sense kicked in and uh, I turned it off. So I lowered my lab jack and the bottom of the flask had melted and it like caved in and the entire um, heating mantle was just totally trashed. Like it had melted the fiberglass of the heating mantle and I guess it had like shorted out or something because it got way hotter than it was supposed to. So uh, I looked at the contents of the flask that remained, and it was just entirely a solid block of graphite. So uh, I ended up putting that flask in the acid bath that we had going at the time. I figured, you know, it would uh, dissolve all of the black tar out of there, all of the graphite. And uh, as I put it into the acid bath, it also shattered the flask. <laughs> so that wasn't a great story for me. Oh, man. I heard a story from a geologist student once. They had a field trip with their professor, and on one field trip next to them, a farmer was putting out cow dung as fertilizer, and apparently the professor didn't bother and told the students you have to taste the substrate to determine the fertility of the soil. So she proceeded to eat the dirt. Uh, I think the takeaway message from this story is that geologists are not only rock lickers, but also dirt eaters. That's hilarious. You know, I, I don't know if you should be tasting soil. If you've ever uh, had a bit of taste of soil and you're a geologist, you can let me know down below. Acetylene is very scary stuff. I wouldn't say I've had trauma with it, but I've had my fair share of scares. In my country, there's this thing called a bamboo cannon. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of it before. I have never heard of a bamboo cannon. When I was a teen, around 14 to 16, some friends and I would gather to burst bamboo, the phrase used locally to say we're going to use a bamboo cannon. A bamboo cannon is basically a length of bamboo, about three to four joints, which is just like the little like notches on the bamboo, long, around maybe four feet in length. And what we would do is we'd take a metal rod, clear out the nodes on the inside of the bamboo, but at the bottom, the last node, we'd leave that one. So if you've never seen the inside of bamboo before, the like where the little notches are, they form like a solid layer. And so they've, they, they've just cleared it out so that they can use this thing as a cannon. The last node, we leave that one. Then about two to three inches from the bottom node, we drill a half inch hole, which we would use as the touch hole of the cannon. 
So usually you'd fill the bamboo with a bit of kerosene, set it on fire, and blow it gently until it heats up the kerosene to the point where it's very volatile. Some people added gasoline, but it's not recommended. So you're kind of blowing on the hole to sustain the combustion inside of the bamboo, so your lungs are kind of the supplier of oxygen. By the way, the bamboo cannon is set at an angle of about 30 degrees. Once the kerosene is hot enough to vaporize, you blow on the hot kerosene in the bamboo through the hole and the air you blow passes over the hot nearby boiling kerosene and fills the chamber with an air fuel mixture till white smoke comes out the top of the bamboo and you ignite it with a stick. Bursting bamboo is very dangerous as there have been some incidents where the bamboo has split open and people got caught on fire from what I've heard. So usually you'd secure the bamboo with wire by wrapping it tightly with binding wire. And so essentially this is just preventing it from like collapsing. Now for the acetylene story. So here we go. We can get calcium carbide at our local agro stores very easily. It's around $2 Canadian per pound. They come in huge rocks and it's still super hard to break with a hammer. If you've never seen calcium carbide before, it literally does look like rocks. So silly 14 year old me decided to use acetylene in a bamboo cannon. I went in the back of my house and I found a really thick bamboo. And so I thought there's no way this is gonna split open. Boy, was I wrong. I threw in a small rock of calcium carbide and added about five mils of water. I had a candle nearby and I didn't even ignite the stick yet, but the flame from the candle was enough to ignite the acetylene in the bamboo and it detonated so unexpectedly. Now, the bamboo hadn't split on me yet. It sounded so loud, and I tried it again, and on the third shot, the bamboo burst open on me violently. It busted open so violently that if my feet were in the way, I'd definitely not have had a good time. So what do I do? I try it again, and this time I cut about three pieces of bamboo, very thick again, and I bought binding wire and tied it tightly. The first one failed, so I abandoned the binding wire idea, as it wasn't strong enough. It busted open on the first hit. For the second and third ones, I bought these super thick zip ties and zip tied the bamboo in many places, and this seemed to work very well. The problems don't end there, though. There was an incident where my hand was over the touch hole, I covered it with a cloth so no acetylene would leak out, and I had the flaming stick ready to ignite it. I remember this so vividly. The gas sort of leaked through the cloth, and I saw wisps of flame when I moved my hand away, and it ignited and burnt my hand really bad through the cloth. If you've never burnt acetylene before, it makes these long, wispy um, flames of soot, unless it's really oxygen-rich, in which case it just explodes. I stopped when my friends decided to fill a Christmas decoration with sand and put it on the top of the cannon to fire it off. It didn't go well. It split open the bamboo with a ton of force and sent sand flying into our eyes. Oh my gosh, this is my experience with acetylene. Yeah, you know, from what I've learned in my experience with acetylene is it's really dangerous. And, you know, even if you're a professor and you think you know what you're doing, oftentimes you don't. I witnessed a similar thing to painting all the glassware with grease, although in a non-chemistry context. When I was working in locomotive maintenance, an apprentice got told to paint over the scratches of the worn paint job. For this, the overseeing worker marked a square with masking tape and handed the paintbrush to the apprentice. Then he went inside to the painting booth to spray paint on another piece. The fatal error was not explicitly telling the apprentice that she was supposed to only paint within the square, and so she spent two hours painting over the teeniest scratches all over the locomotive frame, except for the marked area. It's been like 10 years since, but it always stays with me, as I make sure to give people clear instructions on what to do when I intend to leave them alone for a while. Yeah, that's what I'm familiar with as well when I've worked places, uh, is when you have a new person there, you need to give them as much instruction as possible, and don't assume common sense is common, because common sense has to come from some experience. In the lab where I did my PhD, I heard the story of a male PhD student who was weighing benzyl chloride, which is a really bad lacrimator in like a tear gas, without wearing gloves, oh my gosh. Then he went to the loo, the bathroom, for you non-Brits out there. He came back to the lab to finish his reaction to be met with an excruciating pain down there. He was found by his supervisor two minutes later in the toilets with his gentleman's bits on the sink's edge, being washed with copious amounts of water. Oh, that's terrible. How do you talk your way out of that one? I, I don't even know what I would do in that situation. It's not what it looks like. It's not what it looks like. Sure, bud. Sure. So, Organometallic Lab. Most projects are very sensitive to moisture and or oxygen, so solvents are prepped by refluxing them over a drying agent. This can be anything from molecular sieves to liquid sodium or potassium. Ah, uh, that's a little scary. As necessary, the dry solvent is collected and withdrawn by syringe, and the setup is topped with fresh solvent. If the drying agent is a hydride or an alkali metal, over time a sludge of hydroxide accumulates and eventually the setup has to be cleaned out. If one is using an alkali metal, the sludge contains beads of it, which have to be neutralized safely before the res residual solvent and the hydroxide can be disposed of. This was one of the lab chores assigned to the grad students. We typically call those lab jobs, by the way. 
Typically, one would keep the round bottom flask of sludge in the fume hood and add a small squirt of terputinol from a wash bottle, swirl to mix, and leave the thing to quietly bubble away for 15 or 20 minutes while one went on to mark papers or whatever. Repeat until there was no evidence of any reaction remaining. But we had this postdoc. By the time she'd been with the lab for only a few days, it seemed implausible at best that she had done the work described in her thesis. She made so many mistakes, and she was oblivious in any attempts to correct her. I have many stories about how she utterly failed to follow the procedures necessary to get sensitive reactions to work, and unfortunately, at one point, she was supposed to clean out one of those sludgy flasks. This is the flask we were just talking about. Rather than doing the work in its round bottom flask in a fume hood, she tried to do it in a beaker on her bench, oh my goodness, and instead of a small amount of dry terputinol, she added a large amount of 95% ethanol, 5% water. That's a terrible idea. Unsurprisingly, it quickly caught fire, and instead of doing something about it, she stepped back and started swearing. It was an organometallic lab. Fire extinguishers were handy, and you're supposed to know how to put out fires. A nearby colleague saw what was going on and grabbed a large piece of glassware and covered the beaker. This put out the fire, and eventually the metal ran out of water slash ethanol and ceased generating hydrogen. Solved. Later that afternoon, she resumed the process of getting rid of the remaining alkali metal by doing the exact same thing again. And of course it caught fire again, but this time she knew what to do. Cover the fire. So she grabbed a plastic wash bottle of toluene and dropped it in the, in the beaker and stood back and started swearing as the fire perversely failed to go out. Oh my gosh. <laughs> like, why would you put toluene on a fire? Another colleague heard her, saw what was going on, and snatched the solvent bottle out of the beaker and smothered the fire with another large piece of glassware. The colleague reported the fires to our boss, as was both appropriate and required, since the postdoc had been injured by one of the splashes of burning solvent. The postdoc was really peeved about having been snitched on. Yeah, you know, she might be peeved. When you make mistakes like that, someone has to report it, and it's understandable. I remember in my inorganic lab in the second semester, we got a shiny brand new lab and everything was still clean and white. I worked on my ion lottery on the bench. This is basically like an unknown experiment that people get uh, in their inorganic chemistry. When I noticed it's getting dark behind me, I turned around and the whole fume hood was full of nitrogen dioxide. That's crazy. It's super toxic gas. Absolutely dark brown. Apparently some guy told a girl to dissolve her sample in concentrated nitric acid like 150 mils, and then boil it down. Soon a lab assistant arrived and turned the Bunsen burner off while we all watched the deep brown gas slowly suck up the vent. The air around the institute really wasn't good this day. Yeah, you know, a fume hood takes it away, but it still has to go somewhere. And as Tom says, the atmosphere is nature's bin. Our school had an unfortunate history of incidents, but probably the most peculiar one was where some kids in my buddy's class made a makeshift grenade. This is already insane. It was around the time where we learned about alkali metals. The teacher started the lesson by showcasing a piece of sodium, cutting it up, talking about its properties, etc. Now here's where she might have made a mistake. Another teacher came into the class and asked to talk to her. No clue what it was about, but they went into the storage room behind the classroom and closed the door. After a while, some kids in the first row started playing around. Apparently it started getting crazy because soon enough they started running around in the classroom, including in front of the classroom where the sodium and its little container was. Here's where it gets interesting. One of them managed to knock the container over, so he started to panic and urged his mate to get a bunch of towels to clean up that clear, colorless liquid that spread around the desk. Now to be fair, none of them reacted right at that moment because they all sat there, observing how two uneducated teenagers filled that sodium vial up with water. Oh my gosh! After they were done sorting things out, trying their best to make it look like nothing happened, they quickly went back to their desks to act like they didn't just involuntarily set the teacher up for an unpleasant surprise. Not soon after, the teacher came back, realizing that she left some sodium lying around and not wanting it to oxidize any further. She quickly went and put it back in the vial. I don't know how she did in her previous life, but she had some really good karma because by sheer dumb luck, she went to grab a box, probably in order to show what happens if you put sodium in water. And as soon as she opened the drawer, that was luckily a few meters away from her, there was some hissing, and boom! There was screaming, there was shouting, and there was a perplexed, increasingly angry teacher. No one was injured, but there were little pieces of glass all around the front of the class. I don't think I need to tell everyone about the shouting that occurred. Now, years later, I bet the school still doesn't let any teacher leave the room when there are any chemicals around. Yeah, you know, if we have issues with postdocs doing dumb stuff, you definitely need to be concerned about high school students. Story time. I am not a chemist, but I dabble. Around 10 years ago, when I still lived with my parents, I got an interest in chemistry and ordered an organic chem glass kit from China. I had been slowly collecting and ordering various chemicals, but where I live, I cannot get hydrochloric acid. Getting 91% sulfuric acid is no problem. So for my very first workup in my lab slash bedroom, I decide to make some HCl using sulfuric acid and sodium chloride. I set up a gas generator with a two neck round bottom flask, 
gas takeoff, and a SEP funnel as my dropper. This is just needs an addition funnel here. I start to drip the sulfuric acid in and a little bit of gas is generated, but then it stops. So if it's not clear here, what they're doing is they're protonating the sodium chloride to make HCl gas, and then they're gonna bubble that through a solution of water so that they have HCl like hydrochloric acid. So I add more. At this point, the salt is fully saturated and no more gas generation occurs. I think to myself, ah, the sulfuric acid is too pure, so I need to add a little bit of water. I proceed to remove the SEP funnel and use a beaker to drop in somewhere between 10 and 25 mils of water in, and woof, instantly my room fills with HCl gas. I hold my breath, open a window, and run out of my room. I was so lucky I didn't breathe any of it in, I had to leave my room for a good two hours to clear out. Still only rank second in my list of most stupid lab accidents. Yeah, if that's the second one, I'd love to hear number one. That's absolutely super, super dangerous and very stupid. You should not be doing probably any chemistry in your room. You should always do chemistry in a well-ventilated area because you're not fully educated, no one is, and so you don't know what might happen. That's why we do stuff in a fume hood, because fumes happen, gases are generated. But in this case, you knew you were distilling HCl gas in your room, so I don't really know what you expected to happen. Oh my gosh. The best story I have was in high school. I had quite possibly the stupidest lab partner ever. Her actual present was detrimental to my grade. One example was her dropping a sample all over the ground like five seconds after receiving it from the teacher. However, the worst was when she was asked the time while holding an uncapped flask of concentrated HCl. Thankfully, we were able to wash off all of the acid from her before she got anything more than first degree burns on her hand. Oh my goodness, that's crazy. So I have a story uh, about someone that I'm going to call Violet to protect their identity. So Violet was in many of my classes as an undergrad. And one time, Violet was a lab partner for one of my friends. And my friend hadn't arrived at the lab yet. We were doing a biochem lab, but with Violet's track record, we kind of all knew that she shouldn't be doing stuff on her own because she was a bit of a liability. And so fortunately, this one time, Violet asked like, oh, do you think I should start my lab bef like without without your friend? And I said, I'm like, ah, I think you should probably wait till he gets here. And she's like, I think he'll appreciate it if I start without him. I'm like, I don't think so. I think he'll, I think you should, you should wait. And I was polite, you know, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't tell her why, why we wanted her to wait. I just said, oh, it'd be more considerate if you wait till my friend gets here. And so uh, as soon as my friend arrived in the class, I'm like, don't worry. I told Violet not to start without you. And he was like, thank you. <laughs> so that's not that intense of a Violet story, but I have many more Violet stories. So if you want to hear more Violet stories, comment down below. Is the normal cyclopropane analog called Tinky Winkanic Acid? So if you're not familiar, you can check out the video uh, that we're referring to here. Uh, tinky winkanic acid is shown on the left, and we have a new coined molecule here, tinky winkanic acid. And if you don't think that this is legitimate, you can Google it and see what comes up. The worst in our lab was a beaker mislabeled from a polymer manufacturer. We got benzoyl peroxide, which is our initiator for alkene polymerization. Instead of powder polymer, we were supposed to depolymerize. So put 50 grams into a lab oven to dry the polymer, quote unquote. At 105 degrees Celsius, it detonated. The oven blew apart. Its front door hit me. Oh my gosh. I waited for about four seconds for glass to stop bouncing off the walls before moving and looking around. The beaker had been pushed down so hard the grill it sat on looked like a cartoon impression about four inches into the grill. It was the only day in the past three years that we had ever opened the windows. Likely saved my eardrums, but still couldn't hear for a few hours. Yeah, that's crazy. That's super irresponsible on the part of the manufacturer. I think this is probably even worse than my Blastodex story, because in my case, this wasn't, you know, something that could detonate, even though it baptized our glove box. In your case, it's literally an explosive in this case. This So that's like super duper scary. My high school had a spill in the chemical storage room that sent a few liters of mercury skittering through dozens of the rooms in the halls. A whole other story that I don't know enough details to tell. After they had a biohazard group do cleanup, we had a full inventory and inspection of the storage room, and I got to help. I thought it would be fun. My teacher and I found an unlabeled cardboard box hidden in a back shelf that contained a large 5 to 6 kilogram block of brown something. The teacher later told me that she was able to identify it as elemental sodium. The school apparently bought a ton of it for basic science demonstrations a decade ago, and they had been around so long that the teachers had to cut and dig to get a decent sample. Nobody knew we had a second block hidden back there. All I can think about is that block of sodium sitting unlabeled, wrapped loosely in plastic and protected further by only a cardboard box. No oil, no liquid barrier, in a room with a variety of fun chemicals. Apparently a flask with several liters of mercury and a fire suppression sprinkler in the ceiling. <laughs> That's terrifying. <laughs>
Thank you for watching this episode. If you like these videos, you should check out some other videos from the channel. And with that, I hope you have a great day. Friend of mine said that a big thing in his university was called RF, where you'd freeze a rat with liquid nitrogen and smash it somewhere, sometimes behind a cabinet or whatnot. It got to the point where they had to start putting RF will result in immediate suspension in core syllabi.